السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم to our beloved sisters a very deep topic that we will be discussing this afternoon women and depression so often we are told that depression is self inflicted get it out of your mind it's all in your head um you know become positive um enough is enough you're becoming dramatic and today the intention is to break the stigma The intention my beloved sisters is to break the stigma because depression is real. Depression is not self-inflicted. Depression is an illness just like any other illness, whether it be cancer, whether it be diabetes, whether it be meningitis, whatever it is. We always seem to show empathy to anybody that is struggling with any other sort of medical ailment but when it comes to mental health there's always this thing like your faith is very weak there's something not right with you you did this to yourself and today inshallah our niyat our intention is to educate our listeners and our beloved sisters about depression the effects of depression and you know what depression can be beaten now the reason why i'm saying this to you my beloved sisters this afternoon last year i experienced covid twice and i basically had covid um you know between between the two covid periods it was less than 3 months and i suffered from severe brain fog severe anxiety and severe depression to the point where i didn't i never used to have a blackout i used to have a blank out i struggled to remember basic things i struggled at my workplace and overall i just became very 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 morbid i hated being alive i hated everything about myself because i was losing control i didn't know what was going on with me i was very afraid to go on to medication because obviously everybody knows that if you go on to antidepressants you're going to put on weight and that is a silly silly thing is something that that actually made me refuse to accept help then what happened is life went on as the days went by as months went by alhamdulillah i was blessed to you know make nikah with an amazing amazing human being who loved away from johannesburg because as the listeners must be knowing i am from johannesburg and i had to relocate now because of my fear of change i suffered from loads of anxiety and added depression about the thought of relocation about the thought of leaving my family my friends my loved ones life the way i knew it until i reached a point where i realized to myself that obviously this is coming to my life for a better reason for my life to be better to grow with somebody and make a difference and in order for me to to achieve this i obviously needed help i needed to succumb and say okay i need medical assistance now before i even get to the medical assistance which i'm going to talk to you about just now alhamdulillah alhamdulillah shukr alhamdulillah i've been blessed with the most amazing friends and the most phenomenal family that have given me support and alhamdulillah upon coming to the to to Port Elizabeth and relocating to Port Elizabeth I've been welcomed by the most phenomenal family and being blessed by meeting many amazing women but also the family that I've entered into alhamdulillah with their love with their support and with their duas shukr alhamdulillah I am able to firmly say that I have beaten depression also i must give gratitude to my husband who's actually been very 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 supportive with me through this journey and hence i can bravely do the show and tell you my sisters do not suffer in silence do not let anyone ridicule you do not let anyone make you feel that you do not belong that you are not worthy that depression is self inflicted and you are doing this to yourself because it is an illness and you know what my beloved sisters there is help out there another person who is so 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 significant significant in my life who walked me through this journey who helped me who listened to me who guided me and helped me to get to where I am today is the woman that I'm so honored to be interviewing today my psychologist Diane Moses now Diane is a qualified clinical psychologist who has been working in the private and corporate sectors for the past 20 years she has a passion 
um, she has a passion for facilitating people on their journeys of creating healing and transformation. Diane is always humbled and touched by how people respond and grow when given a safe and contained space to talk, explore and introspect about their lives. She believes in the philosophy of walking with people, meeting them where they are on their journey and facilitating them in creating new purpose and meaning in their lives. Diane is currently consulting in a clinic based in Randburg in Gauteng, where she works with adults dealing with depression and anxiety. Alhamdulillah, she has been God sent to me. She really has held my hand through this journey. And shukar alhamdulillah, today I can tell you, like I said, confidently sit and speak to all our beloved listeners and tell you that depression is can be beaten and there is help out there. If you do have any queries, any questions, any comments, you are welcome to WhatsApp us on 067-236-3487. All right, Diane, that was a mouthful. (laughs) But I think something I needed to share with my beloved listeners, because like we say, you know what? There's no need to be suffering in silence. There's no need to be isolated. And we need to go back to the basics when we talk about what exactly is depression. So first and foremost, welcome to IFM and welcome to Phenomenal Woman. Thank you so much, Bibi. And I just want to say I really, really appreciate this opportunity um, to be chatting with you and your listeners. What an honor and what a privilege to be here today just to, you know, talk about depression, hopefully normalize it a little bit, um, not in any way to take away from how uh, debilitating and difficult it is to experience and go through depression, but to really hopefully put across the message that it is an illness. Um, it definitely can be treated and that people, you know, hopefully after today will feel a little less stigmatized around the subject of depression and will be more willing to seek out treatment and help maybe a little bit earlier than they would have otherwise when they really feel they have no other option available to them. Absolutely. Uh, now, Diane, we all have those days when we feel down and sometimes, you know, those days can become weeks. At what point in this whole process, is it time to say that, listen, this is more than me just feeling blue, but something more severe is happening and that could be I'm depressed? I think, yes, the time frame is very important, Bibi. It's, um, you know, we usually say anything two weeks or longer um, is, is really time to start thinking about going to see a doctor, either a psychiatrist or a GP. But it's also about the intensity and the severity of your symptoms. So people who are having suicidal thoughts don't wait two weeks. You need to really be addressing this a lot sooner. Um, Anything that, you know, if you're feeling constant sadness, if you're crying more often than usual, if your behavior has changed more um, and, and you're not recognizing things that you do, Um, If you are losing interest in things you previously enjoyed, so something that you really love to do or you did regularly and often you just don't have the energy or the motivation to do anymore, those are really um, very important signs to be aware of and signals to be aware of. This is something more than just feeling blue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in all honesty, we have to be realistic that when COVID struck, a lot of people were put in a position that they have never, ever imagined. Unfortunately, a lot of businesses closed. Um, people yes. were still suffering from lingering, uh, sorry, lingering um, effects of COVID long haul. Like I gave the example of mm-hmm. mine with the brain fog. And also, unfo- you know, there, sadly, there's been loss and death in families. Um, you know, sometimes people may have needed to relocate in the sense that they needed to downscale the lives that they were used to because mm-hmm. of maybe their business crashing during COVID. So many reasons where life can become very overwhelming, very stressful, and also lead to depression? Absolutely. And I mean, depression can be, uh, like you've just said, any of those environmental factors, um, anything that happens that's stressful, traumatic, can trigger depression. It can also be biological. So somebody who may be, I call it a vulnerability, they have a vulnerability to develop depression, but they haven't they haven't developed it up till now. Maybe then they go through something traumatic like losing a job or um, experiencing loss or getting severely ill, absolutely trauma. And that triggers the depression. So yes, it, it, I think COVID and 
the effects of COVID, the social effects, the physical effects, have all made um, people a little bit more at risk, perhaps. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And mm. also the thing to also remember and to remind our listeners that depression knows no race, no color, no creed, mm. no gender. It strikes mm. at absolutely any time. And Anybody. everybody at some point in their life will experience a depression. It could be, mm. um, it could be a divorce. It could be death of a loved one. It could be, like I said, loss of job. It could be absolutely anything Am I correct in saying this? Yes, no, absolutely. I think, you know, we've we've actually identified certain risk factors which are all of the ones you've mentioned, as well as anybody who's socially isolated, so Mm. people who are feeling alone, people, and obviously social isolation became a very big reality in COVID. Um, People who don't have close interpersonal relationships um, for whatever reason, Any uh, employment that may be uncertain or people losing jobs, as you've said, anyone divorced or separated, um, and anyone abusing any kind of substances, alcohol, anything like that, um, depression can often occur in conjunction with that as well. Mm, mm, mm. And even probably witnessing somebody close to you going through um, Mm. difficulty also can strike a depression because, you know, you you want to help and you don't know how. And often for parents, it could be like, I wish I could do more. And that sort of kind of self-blame or mm. something where you lose control in the sense where you feel I cannot assist it actually trigger your own depression. Often that happens with I women. Think, absolutely. And women like to be the protectors and the nurturers and the carers and like to have all the answers for their kids and their families, of course. And feeling that sense of helplessness. Um, I think can be very debilitating, especially if it's ongoing helplessness, you know, Mm. and then it can be a sign of depression that has developed as well. That's one of the very um, common characteristics, feeling helpless, feeling stuck, feeling like you can't get out of the situation. Mm, mm. Diane, if we can go a little bit more into detail, what happens to your Mm. body when you are in a depression? So we have a lot of physical reactions as well as emotional reactions. As I mentioned earlier, there can be a sense of crying all the time and feeling very sad. That's your that's one of the emotional, feeling helpless, feeling guilty. Those are some of the emotions that can come out. But also in terms of physical, I think one of the, the biggest signs of depression is a loss of energy, but a real loss of energy. Um, people often talk about feeling like they can't get out of bed. Mm. Um, Even doing the smallest thing like getting in the shower and brushing their teeth uh, becomes the biggest effort. There is absolutely no energy to do these things. They often, it's, it's also linked to struggling to sleep. Sometimes they sleep too much. Sometimes they don't sleep at all. They suffer from insomnia. They wake up in the middle of the night and they lie awake for hours with their minds racing. Mm. Um, Another one is appetite, changes in your appetite. So some people, again, it's different for different people. Some people might eat a lot more. Some people might just stop eating and lose a tremendous amount of weight. That's also a physical sign. And then again, with your memory, and like you've mentioned with COVID, kind of very similar in terms of that, you know, your concentration gets affected where mm. you can't you can't actually pay attention and concentrate. You forget things. Um, memory gets affected. So you can't remember um, things that maybe would have just been so easy in the past to remember that suddenly you can't remember. You feel distracted. You feel like you, it's difficult to pay attention. Your mind wanders easily. And of course, this can lead to issues at work, mm. um, you know, that, and that's when we say that, you know, your occupational functioning and, and can be, really be affected because maybe if you're in a job that requires a lot of concentration, it's going to be very, very stressful if you find you're making mistakes more often and you're battling to do things. So that just compounds everything. Mm-hmm. You know, um to ask you again, what are the early signs of depression? Sometimes, like we mm. say, you know, you could be thinking, I'm just having a really, really bad day or a really bad week. Mm. Or you tell yourself, you know, I'm exaggerating. Um, things are going to get easier. But maybe for loved ones, because sometimes, you know, you need the push from a loved one to say, um, I think we need help now. So what are the mm. signs that loved ones should be looking out for? Like, you know, you say the obvious signs would be, you know, they want to stay in bed all day or um, mm. um, or lack of sleep. And, you know, there's feelings of being morbid and, you know, appetite increase or decrease. But other signs, mm-hmm. like like often there's, you know, there's this talk about about death, talking about 
death constantly. Mm. There is a major red but, flag? Um, yes, absolutely. It would be a major red flag. It's often um, one of the signs, but there are many other signs. So changes, kind of changes in that person's personality. So maybe they're w- really irritable where they used to be quite patient mm. or they, they really um, find they're snapping at people more often. Um, and getting agitated quickly. So any change in behavior, but definitely talking about very negative things, someone who's depressed is really going to struggle to see the good in anything. They are going to be fixated on bad things that are happening. They're going to be talking a lot about, um, you know, the negative stuff. They're going to be really thinking about that because it's very hard to actually look at anything positive when you are in that state of depression. Mm. The other sad thing is that when you need to be helped in this state, uh, the the obvious combination or the you know the combination that makes sense is consulting with a psychiatrist as well as a psychologist. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the moment you say psychiatrist again, it's the stereotype. Oh, I don't need to see a shrink. I'm not mad. There's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with me. And at this point. It's where we need to like break the stigma. So what would be your message now to our listeners? Because I mean, obviously, if somebody is struggling like this, it's not that they lack faith in God. It's not like Mm -hmm. they've forsaken life. This is happening to them. It's beyond their control. There's nothing that they can do to stop it, but they can get help. So what would you say to someone when they're like, I will not go and see a psychiatrist. I'm not nuts. I'm not mental. Absolutely, and I think the stigma is something that we really have to work on, on on trying to educate people in terms of breaking that because it does, it stops people from getting help early on in the process. And that's often what we see is that people are really in major depression because they haven't, um, you know, they may have seen the signs, they may have known something's really wrong, but because of that stigma, because of feeling like I'm weak mm-hmm. or there's something wrong with me, like you've used the words crazy or out of my mind and, and that kind of thing, that they will not go and, and see and they don't want other people to judge them. They don't want to be um you know, look down on sometimes by other people. So as a community and as people and as women, I think supporting other women, it is so, so important to change the narrative around depression, to to start using different words when we talk about it, you know. It's nothing, I mean, I, I know when people come to me and they say, I'm really not crazy. And I say, no, absolutely not. You're not crazy. But, and they say, but I'm not normal. And I say, but what do you even mean by that? Exactly. You know, and we try and, we try and explore that and we try and understand that. And I say to them, okay, so maybe your behavior has changed. Maybe you're feeling different and you're feeling like, you know, things are out of your control. And we turn the narrative around. We start talking about the actual issues instead of just labeling them and, and kind of giving them these very negative connotations. You know, mm. people often say, I, I, I don't want to be perceived as weak. Yes. Well, I, I, yes. my, my very, the thing that I often say to people, my very common thing that I, I try and explain to people who come into the hospital, because I think that is their biggest fear. People will find out I'm here and they'll think I'm weak. I say, you know, it's actually the strongest people in this hospital. It's the most courageous people in this hospital. Absolutely. It's the people who have felt so, so ill and have come and asked for help and are now doing this in this work on themselves and are trying to find the skills to deal with what they have to deal with. And that for me just is courage. And it's, it's so important to have the support of community and friends and people just understanding that. Absolutely. And also like the whole fear of what will people say. But we have to ask yourself mm-hmm. that right now when you are feeling so down and you are so mm-hmm. gloomy and morbid, all those people who are you, you are f- fearing, what will they say? Where are they? Mm. Where mm. are they? So and, we need- and I think sometimes, Bibi, it's also about they don't know what to do. Exactly. You know, sometimes there's a sense of helplessness. And, and, and that, those comments, I think, often come from that. They come from a sense of, I'm afraid. I don't know how to deal with this. This mm. is really scary. And so they come out with things like, oh, you know, you're just having a bad day or oh, you're crazy, you're behaving badly or you're behaving crazily. And it's more their fear because they're feeling so helpless in that situation. Deep inside, they know there's something wrong. They know that they don't know what to do. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, by talking about it, by educating people, by, by having these, these programs like you're having today, is just so, so valuable that people start hearing this differently and thinking about it differently and then talking about it differently. Hopefully that will start making a difference. We pray the Almighty 
to accept everyone's efforts, mm-hmm. my darling. You know, when it comes to self-medicate, again, you know, when before the step of going to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, sometimes people would say, okay, let me try some herbal remedies to help me with my sleep or maybe let me try, you know, something over the counter to give me this energy mm-hmm. and make me feel better. But that actually, um, you know, your thoughts on that because... Again, you know, taking medication like this, obviously, uh, we want to boost the serotonin levels, but it's dangerous because mm. it's not monitored. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, again, it's got a lot to do with stigma. The reason why people would maybe, um, you know, go quietly into the pharmacy and just grab something off the shelf and hope that that helps because of that fear of other people knowing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think you've got to get the the expert advice in terms of this because um, this is this is serious. You know, you wouldn't just kind of, if you had high blood pressure or if you had been diagnosed with cancer, you probably wouldn't just run off and grab the nearest thing that you don't know much about. So I think doing your research, um, talking to people in the medical industry, um, really being knowledgeable about what you're using if you are going to use something natural is very, very important. But yes, um, going to GPs, going to medical doctors and getting, you know, correct advice It's about having a relationship with that doctor. It's, you know, I often think people are are afraid and they kind of look up to a doctor and they think this person's going to treat me, make me better. And yes, that person has got knowledge and they've studied Mm -hmm. a long time and they do have the information, but they need you in that in that process. They need you to be a part of that process. You need to work together with your doctor, um, you know, to to get to get that healing. Now, Diane, are women more susceptible to depression than men? And if so, why? So I think a lot of the research has shown, yes, that they are. Um, There are a couple of different reasons for this, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the the more obvious ones to maybe look at is that, you know, our hormones are different. Mm. And there's been research in terms of the link between um, fluctuations in hormones, changes in hormones, women going through different um, developmental stages in their lives. Puberty is one, um, pregnancy another, perimenopause, menopause. So this is when our bodies are changing, our hormones are fluctuating. And... I, I'm not an expert um, in terms of this medical history, but I think, you know, there has been a lot of research that I've read up about on estrogen and the fact that it is actually a protective factor. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we have lower levels of estrogen, there's, there's a, a higher risk that people, or that women could um, develop depression if their estrogen levels drop. So yes, that's probably one of the biggest reasons. Um, I think the other ones, uh, Bibi, are that Women and men often, um, you know, through society and again through stigmas and how we brought up and what we taught, we express emotion differently. Mm. So perhaps women might be more, um, you know, I don't know if the word's comfortable, but they, they socialize that they can cry, they can um, feel sad, they can express those emotions, whereas men um, are more likely to get angry. So that's more acceptable, if I can put it that way, for for men. And so uh, women might go for help because, or people might encourage a woman to go for help more regularly because she's she's crying, she's feeling tearful all the time, whereas a man will be maybe holding it in, Mm -hmm. not showing people. So I think that could also be a reason why the incidence is, is so much lower because I think what we are seeing today is that when we educate men more and again, we start bringing these uh, stigmas down. There are more men being diagnosed now as well. Mm-hmm. But at the mm-hmm. moment, it seems that women are, the, the figures are higher. The when it figures comes to are them. higher. Yeah. And then also mm-hmm. when we talk about postnatal depression, postnatal depression is very, very real. So if you can just please yeah. elaborate on that for us. No, absolutely. So I think it's, it's again, they're doing more research when it comes to this field before and it was... Um, just postnatal depression, they're now saying they're going to rename it to perinatal distress, which means that it can occur during and after pregnancy, not just after pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, a lot of the same symptoms of um, of depression, that people lose the positivity, they lose interest in things that previous brought them pleasure, they're very prone to anxiety and panic. Um, again, the energy changes, their sleep patterns can change. And often this doesn't get diagnosed straight away because, you know, being a new mom and having mm. this newborn baby, you don't get a lot of sleep and yes. you do feel tired. And, you know, um, 
you, uh, everything changes. I mean, uh, according to, you know, our appetites change as well and, and all of that kind of thing. So they often think that maybe it's just that, you know. And again, it's, it's the amount of time that happens. But I think one of the very important factors to remember is that when a mom feels so worthless and so helpless and so lost and, and just, yeah, you know, mm. that she starts to think, I can't be with my baby or I want to harm my baby mm. or I don't want this child anywhere near me. That is a very, very um, important sign to remember that, you know, there's something more going on here. Yes. This is not just baby blues. It's not just... Um, the norm after having a, a baby and hormones going out of kilter a little bit. This is something much more severe. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, this fear that, you know, um, if I don't embrace my child, you know, my baby, I'm a bad mother. Uh, I'm sure yes. also what would come in would be a lot of, um, you know, self guilt and negative self talk mm-hmm. because, again, you want to be the way you think society um, expects you to be. But again, this is now beyond your control. Yes. And I think it's that fear, you know, that fear of is there something really wrong with me? Is there something mm. so inherently wrong with me as a woman that I should be having these natural instincts? And for a lot of women, they don't have natural instincts right away when babies are born. And that's okay. That, you know, they, they, it comes. And with the correct help and support, that will happen. But for a lot of women, they need medication. They need um, to see a psychiatrist and to have the proper diagnosis and then the correct medication prescribed because that is very, very serious and that is something that has to be addressed. No, you know, before I even ask you the next question, you know, I have to mm-hmm. ask you this one because I know this was a big issue for me as you would remember when I used to be sitting across you. Mm-hmm. Do I need to take the medication because it's going to make me fat? <laughs> And, 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 you know, I reached a point where I thought that I would rather be a little bit meaty, if I could say mm-hmm. that, <laughs> than be feeling down and hopeless all the time. I'd be happy. You know, I'd, my, my sanity is much more important. I want to be happy. Mm-hmm. I want to get, you know, back into the groove of things. And it's okay if I'm a little bit fat while I'm on the medication. Eventually, it will go. But the important thing is that my sanity is intact and I'm feeling better. Absolutely. So something Absolutely. that also makes a lot of women very nervous when it comes to mm-hmm. the medication regarding a depression and getting help. It does. And I think, you know, it's it's definitely a reality. But... Again, it's, it's, people are different. So some people might put on weight on certain medications, others don't. Mm. So again, that's, that's got to be seen as we go along, you know. And yes, having that good relationship with your doctor again, you're able to talk to the doctor about that. And if they can adjust something, they, they will. But if they can't, it is something that again, we have to talk through and we have to, um, come to a level of acceptance, like you say, that my mental well-being is actually the most important thing right now because without that mental well-being, everything else falls to pieces. Everything depends Mm. on our mental well-being, on our mental health. Um, When we are feeling out of control, when we are, you know, really in these terrible spaces and we can't function, nothing else matters. Like you say, nothing else is, is as important. So it's prioritizing that and it's realizing and understanding that, yes, we can exercise. And that's another thing when you talk about natural remedies. I I think, Mm. you know, to do in conjunction with medication, exercise is a very important thing. And it doesn't have to be intense exercise. It doesn't have to be joining a gym and working out for hours. It's. I, I, I always say to, to my patients, it's about moving around. It's about walking. It's about being outside in nature and the sun, just getting some sun on you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because that's actually nature's antidepressant. Uh, antidepressant. Yes. It releases endorphins and it makes us feel better. It lifts mood a little bit. So that exercise is, is a very important thing to do um, as well. And something just simple like just going outside, you know, bare feet and standing mm. on the grass or if you're fortunate Absolutely. enough to be living near the ocean and because that's grounding, yeah. that feeling of earthing, it, it's just, it's just mm. re- rejuvenating. It's just something Absolutely. different. Absolutely. It's really, really something different. You know, um, obviously, when it comes to menopause, uh, that, uh, you know, brings along with it a whole lot of different symptoms. And then again, we spoke about, you know, um, the the loss of estrogen. So that can, can it also, um, you know, increase your chances of being depressed when you're going through this transition period? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, you know, people going through menopause can have a woman going through menopause can have a higher risk of depression. Um, there's definitely research on that. 
Um, and they've actually, I was, I was reading something the other day about, and it's not to say I'm pushing um, mm. these ther- these therapies or anything, but it's it's actually a protective factor um, to take um, things to boost estrogen. You know, to take mm. medications mm. to boost mm. estrogen. It's not to say people have to do that necessarily, but um, it just shows the link. It shows the link between low levels of estrogen yes. um, and how you know your risk can definitely increase. So much valuable information shared with our beloved listeners. We're going to be continuing after the ad break. To our beloved sisters, don't go away. You are tuned into the Phenomenal Woman Show here on IFM 88.3. And today we're talking about women and depression. And Alhamdulillah, I'm very, very, very happy to be interviewing my psychologist and my friend, Diane Moses, as we move along the questions, the common fears and breaking the stigma of depression and what will people say syndrome. That's what I'm going to call it, Diane. What will people say (laughs) syndrome? And I need to ask you this because I just received a, a, a message from one of our listeners right now saying that, you know, I really, really feel down all the time. I don't know how to get help because everybody at home just tells me it's in my head. I'm struggling and I can relate to everything that you just spoke about right now. 
what mm. do I do? And it was, you know, it's so in line with what I was going to ask you just now because she also makes a comment here that I often think of death and suicide, mm. but I fear mm. God. You know, I'm Allah fearing. I would never do that, but I don't know mm. where these thoughts have come from and I don't know what to do. And that was my next question, that suicidal thoughts is a common symptom of depression. It doesn't mean that your faith in God is weak. It really doesn't no. mean that you want... you. you the thing is that you do not want to end your life. You actually just want to end the pain. That's the difference. Mm. So if you could just and, please assist. Yeah, I think that, you know, having suicidal thoughts is, as I said earlier, um, one of the biggest signs, but one of the most serious signs. And, you know, then we need to know that we are feeling very helpless and hopeless and we need to reach out for help. The, you know, at that point, a person can't really wait and shouldn't really wait much longer. As I said, there is plenty of help, but the the suffering that goes with that is just, you know, the suffering mm, that goes with mm, that is just mm. a terrible, terrible thing. And there are, um, I, I know I did send through some numbers um, mm, that, mm. I, that I hope your listeners will, will call the, the station and numbers for Lifeline where you can actually talk to somebody um, a number for SADAC, um, any emergency center at the hospital. Um, you know, if you can just take yourself to the hospital, get to the hospital and talk to them there, there will definitely be help for you. Um, because I think, you know, something that's gone on for so long, as I say, you don't need to suffer. There is help out there. Mm, mm, mm. And I think worrying about what people would say in the sense that, you know, you think, and, and a lot of the times it's not so much what people would say, it's what we perceive that people would mm. say. People have their own challenges. It's maybe our own uh, um, fears and negativity where we would think um, somebody's going to think I'm mad. Somebody think, is going to think yeah. I've lost control. It, it's nothing like that. The whole mm. thing is about getting help for yourself because in, in all honesty, when somebody is going through a depression, again, like we said, no sort of depression is self-inflicted. It, it happens. Mm. But when you're going through this, it doesn't just affect the person that is suffering from the, the depression. It affects affects the entire family mm, mm, absolutely. and there's, there's support necessary for family members as well because it can become overwhelming it can become very debilitating for those who love you also yes yes and i think like i said a, a little bit earlier it's that feeling of helplessness in the family when we don't know what to do to help our loved ones Mm -hmm. um, it's a scary feeling. It's a horrible feeling. And I think, you know, there are groups and um, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group is, is a wonderful organization. They have so many, well, they've gone online now, which is one of the, the benefits and the good things about COVID, yes. um, is that they actually run online groups now as well. And support groups for family members, as well as support groups for people going through the depression. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that that is so useful, Bibi, because I think, you know, again, meeting other people who are in maybe a similar space, maybe they're very different reasons why you're depressed, but you, you kind of connect because you know that somebody else has some understanding of what you're going through mm -hmm. or has, has some, you know, can connect with you on some level. And it, it's so useful in terms of treatment and feeling that sense of it's not only me. Yes. Um, there are other people out there who are experiencing this is a really important part of the treatment process. I have another comment here, which again ties in. It's, you know, with the question I was going to ask you that when we talk about psychotherapy playing a significant role in recovery. So the question mm. is, can I just go to my psychiatrist and just get the meds that I need and get counseling, you know, in support for my family? And then there's another question, you know, which I'm going to ask that maybe someone will feel, ah, I probably just need to speak to someone. So I'll just get a psychologist. But again, mm. the danger of that, because you basically need, both you need the psychiatrist and the psychologist because that's what psychotherapy is you need um you know both of them to be working hand in hand am i correct i think yeah i mean it, look it depends on some people do very well in therapy mm -hmm. it depends how severe again the depression is um you know so some people do do very well um just with therapy learning skills if they have the energy to do that maybe i mean if if it has like a milder depression might not impact your motivation and your energy levels so intensely so you might be able to get on with that but i mean when somebody is really severely depressed 
then the medication is the thing that's going to help with that. It's going to help with lifting your energy levels. It's going to help with stabilizing your mood. Um, and only then would you really be ready to engage in therapy. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to do therapy with somebody who is battling to get out of bed. Um, you know, they, they don't have an interest. They don't have the motivation. They don't have the energy. They, they might want to really do it ultimately, but they just can't. Mm. Um, so I think it's about being assessed. I think that's what's very, very important. Um, you know, going to, and a clinical psychologist can assess a patient as well as a psychiatrist. A clinical psychologist can't prescribe medication. So after the assessment, they would say to the person, um, I recommend that you see a, a psychiatrist and this is the reason why. Um, and then maybe refer that person on to somebody. Um, or that person could obviously choose to go to somebody they'd heard about or knew about. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the, the, then the psychiatrist would also do a, a really thorough assessment, ask lots of questions um, to just assess the, the, um, the depression, to assess is this depression or is it something else perhaps, or are there more than, you know, just the depression going on? Um, maybe they might feel that there's something physical as well and then they'd send them for other tests and that kind of thing. Yes. So, yes, it, it's really nice when a psychiatrist and a, and a therapist can work hand in hand together yes. um, because then, you know, the, the treatment is usually very, very effective. Absolutely. And, and also, you know, when it comes to medication, you kind of also need to find the right fit. There could be certain medication mm -hmm. that is really not for you. The side effects may be really gruesome and there's others mm -hmm. where you can cope. So that's also very important in the sense where, you know, you don't want to try self-medicating and no. you also don't want to, like, what could work for your friend doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Mm, and absolutely. I think also very important to mention, you know, to our beloved listeners is that burnout is also mm. a form of depression because it's like your mm. body is saying, I'm giving you all these signs and you're not listening, so I'm going to take charge now. I'm going to take control. Yes. So also burnout very important. Burnout can definitely lead to depression, absolutely. Yes. So burnout, mm. you know, you burnt out at work or you burnt out with family. Um, this is not right. This is not normal. This is your body screaming mm. out to say, I'm putting on the brakes. Yes. And, you need and I think, you know, it's absolutely imperative that people listen to their bodies mm. because we don't. We, we so often just push the headache. You know, we, we have a headache, we take a panada, we take something and we just push it aside and we kind of push through it. That's what I often hear people saying mm. um, and try and just move on and, and ignore it or distract ourselves from it. And then the body talks a bit louder and you might have worse headaches or different symptoms as well. And it is so important to listen and you know when we're tired we need to listen to that as well I think our culture really um, equates success with being busy mm. with having so many things to do and, and so many things on our plate and if we've if we're super busy all day and all weekend and then we're successful and this is really scary because you know it's it's kind of not leaving any room for rest and relaxation and enjoyment and fun and those are the really important things in life i always say to people those are our motivators right yes. those are the things that help us um, energize ourselves and yet we are so hectically busy life is so chaotic and we we tend to push those things aside or we just don't do them at all mm -hmm. um but I think, yeah, when we don't, yes, a little bit <laughs> exactly. But it's 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 but, absolutely hundred percent correct. And yeah. also, you know, your role as a psychologist or other psychologist, um, you know, how does a psychologist, you know, basically assist uh, patients to deal with the depression? You know, I I could do this entire hour on my own, my darling. If I have to start <laughs> with, you know, the amount of help that you've given me. But obviously, like I said, I'm using me as an example to to, to, mm. to let our listeners know that there is help out there. You are not yes. suffering alone. We understand you. We know where you're coming from. Get that help because you deserve to be, mm. you know, you mm. deserve to be well and happy and living your positive okay. life. So mm. as a psychologist, again, you know, basically the skills um, that is imparted with the patient, if you can just tell us a little bit about that. So, yeah, uh, psychotherapy is about talking, really, to, to simplify it. It's, you know, when a person, when I meet a person for the first time, I chat with them about just who they are and I, I assess where they're at at the moment and what's really brought them to therapy and what they really want to work on. So it's a getting to know the person. It's forming a relationship with the person. It's having a connection with the person. If a person goes to see a psychologist and they really feel that they, they didn't, 
start to form a connection. I mean, obviously it takes time to form mm. that relationship. Um, but if they didn't feel anything there, then, you know, the recommendation is please go and look for somebody, somebody different because you need that connection. That's the essence. That's the basis of therapy. It's feeling safe. It's feeling that I can talk to this person about things that maybe I haven't ever told anybody else about. And I think the fact that this person, we don't know them, they're not part of the family, is what helps with that. Mm. You know, it's a little bit of distance. It's a little bit of a, a sense of I'm not going to be judged. I think that's a big part of it as well, to feel accepted, to feel that no matter what I say, um, it's going to be taken seriously and it's mm. going to be listened to. It's going to be heard. I'm not going to be judged. I'm not going to be mocked for the things I say. Um, the, the psychotherapist tries to understand where that person's coming from. They really try. I do. I, I ask lots of questions. I try to um Really understand, I don't assume anything. I try to understand why the person's feeling like they are or what's, what's contributing to this person feeling like they are. And so this relationship starts to grow. And I think it's in that relationship that a lot of the healing takes place because mm. like we've said, out there, we don't always have this acceptance. We don't always have this understanding. We don't always have people listening. Um, you know, so it's in that relationship that the that the healing, as I say, starts to to happen. And then there's also skills that a psychotherapist can teach. You know, mm -hmm. um, really hands on things, and I, I believe very much in that. I, I often try things myself um, before <laughs> I, um, you know, tell my patients about it. Yes. So if I'm going to be doing breathing techniques, believe you me, I've done those breathing techniques and I've figured <laughs> them out. And I've, I've really worked on them to try and see is this useful or not for myself. And then if I feel it's useful, I will share it with people and I will mm. tell them this is how I did it and this is what I found difficult and this is, you know, maybe try it and see what you think. And it's about listening to the feedback from from your patients and hearing, oh, no, I really don't like that technique. And then mm. saying, okay, we'll chuck it out. Let's look for something else. And so we, we work together in this relationship and we, we go on this journey together to, to you know, help in recovery. Definitely. I, think that, I, don't, I don't know if and, that explains. And, you know, it, really, it does a lot. And, and also, you know, it's important that when, when somebody is going to a psychologist, you, you literally bearing your soul. You are mm -hmm. vulnerable, but you are putting everything out there. The mask is off. You don't yes. need to worry about what my family think of me, what my partner think of me, what will society think of me. You All you need to worry is about what do I think of myself? If I'm yes. in a positive frame of mind, well and good, how do I get better? If I'm in a negative frame of mind, not very good, but I have to mm. get better. And that's, mm. you know, basically what your psychologist is going to hold your hand through. So that's also very mm. important. And, and I'm so glad that you mentioned there's obviously an atmosphere of non-judgment because that is mm. what every human being, no matter how confident you may be, we <sighs> all we all do, we all are afraid at some point that yes. somebody is going to judge me, somebody is going to mm. misunderstand me. And um, that should never be the case. Again, the support of family and friends is so important in helping mm. a patient to recover. Because in all honesty, you know, you're spending maybe half an hour in, in consultation with your psychiatrist. You're spending maybe an hour with your psychologist. But the rest of your time and your day is with family and mm. friends. And that mm. support is the most important. Um, yes. Please, if you can. I think that is, you know, it's it's like we said, a risk factor and one of the things that, you know, contributes to a person developing depression is feeling isolated, feeling mm. like they have nobody who they can talk to. Sometimes people feel like that and it's not actually the case. Um, I think therapy also can assist in that in terms of bringing families in and, and talking with families. And those are very interesting sessions where, obviously, where often we find that, you know, the person thought they, they didn't have support, but actually they do it's just that they don't know how to support that person so facilitating those interactions is also a very important part of the psychotherapy um i think yeah that the support is you know just feeling accepted feeling loved is, is very very important Absolutely. by our family and friends Absolutely. and you know being able to sometimes confide in, in family and friends sometimes helps us to get the help we need you know when we heard and when people say to us you know, I really can see that you're struggling um, and you need to go and get help. And that sometimes helps that person just take that extra step to do it. Mm -hmm. And also, like you say, that, you know, it can scare people around you because they don't know how to mm -hmm. deal with you. But sometimes, you know, they don't need to say anything. They just need to listen yes. because that also yes. really, really helped. You know, another thing that, that 
which is often I think I even mentioned this when we started the show about breaking the stigma and also mm. when you want to help somebody it can become overwhelming for you and you know um, you'll always hear these words be positive um, pick yourself mm. up you know you need to switch off of this you can't be like this all the time you need to mm. to mm. move on you you know you're doing this to yourself nobody wakes up feeling morbid no. Purposely. Well, no one wants purposely. to wake up Yeah, morbid, nobody wakes, yeah. does this purposely. Who, who would mm. want to have suicidal thoughts constantly? Who mm. would want to be mm. tired all the time? And, and a simple thing like making a cup of tea can become such a, a, a daunting task. I mean, who would want to yes. feel this way? So again, maybe if you could just share with us that for family members and friends, you know, to show support to somebody who's going through a depression, what would be the right words, the motivating words, the, the empathetic words in mm. helping them cope with this um, difficult time that they're going through? Well, exactly what you said, Bibi. I think it's about listening and just, it's, you know, saying to a person, but hearing what they're saying, really hearing. I mean, I think often we don't listen and we don't hear. So we might do all the things that look like we're listening, but we're on our phone or we um, in our head thinking about what we have to do later or something that we that's bothering us. So we're not always present. We're not always right there in that moment. And I think it's important to try and be more present, to to really hear that when a person is saying, "Sure, you know, I'm really not, I'm really not struggling," you know, I think we want to encourage them. And often the the thing would be, oh, "Of course, you you're fine. You're not struggling. You're doing great." You know, and that, that's what we think is encouraging. But again, that puts more pressure. That that often makes that person feel sure. Okay, I'm really either I've got to really be a lot worse to for someone to notice, or they're not getting it. So just listening, just saying to them, you know, is this what you mean? Is this is this what you're saying? Am I understanding correctly? And having a conversation, just not not needing, like you said, to provide solutions at this point. The solutions are not really, you know, families are not expected to be psychologists. They're not expected to be psychiatrists. They're there to say to that person, it sounds like we need to go and look and find if if there's Mm. other help available. It sounds like, you know, you really are struggling with this or you really are in a desperate space. What can I do? I think asking somebody what they need is also just very, very important. We often just automatically want to fix it or or do it and, and sort it out. So we just assume, we think to ourselves, okay, well, if I was in this position, what would I need? And then we do mm, that. And sometimes mm. it's the right thing, but often it's not. And often it's it's just asking that question, what do you need? What can I do? Is there something I can do? Mm, um, mm. Often that is, is just so powerful and so important because that person actually just feels heard and feels like, okay, I can breathe a little bit because somebody gets me. Somebody is hearing and, and knowing what I'm saying. Yes, yes. And also, I think it's very important to maybe, you know, just discuss this briefly, that depression is not something that you are going to recover from in a week or Mm. in two weeks or even in two months. It's a process. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, um, medications do take a while to work. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they're not um, quick fixes. They They don't work overnight. And often there's a lot of frustration with that. Um, but yes, learning new, new skills once that medication is working and once your energy levels go up, learning new skills to deal with your life and to deal with stresses or traumas or things that could come up or have come up in the past is a process. It takes time. Sometimes we, we learn that relationships that we are in are contributing to crises in our lives or difficult mm. things. And we have to learn to set boundaries and we have to learn. There's often a very, um, it can be quite a long process. So I think, yeah, the expectation that society likes quick quick fixes these days. And yes, we have all our just pop a pill and everything will be fine. And and <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, but no, this, this is something... You know, but I think again, it's about really understanding that this is about your mental wealth. Your mental wealth. Listen to me. That's a really good thing to think mm. about. Your mental health. Um, it is wealth. It's it's everything at the end of the day. Your mental well-being. Your sanity. And so it's going to take a little bit longer. We're going to have to put a little bit more effort and energy into into working on it and into doing these, practicing the skills or, you know, changing certain things in our lives that maybe are not contributing to good mental well-being. Definitely. Um, so it's a commitment that you actually make to yourself at the end of the day that says, you know, I'm going to do this for me. I'm going to do this because I, when I'm a better person, everybody gains at the end of yes, the day. Yes, yes. Um, 
you know, and so, but I am going to do it for me because when I'm okay, then I'm, I'm more effective in my life and I can do things and I'm happier and yeah, it's just all around people People being happy you know i just have to share this you know because this is something very important to me that was constantly said to me and i I, it really really mattered to me and you know the people that offered me this assistance they know who they are but you know the Mm -hmm. one was like you know always i love you i believe in you i know who you really are and we are going to get there that meant a lot to me because you know it meant to me that i was not alone another thing Mm -hmm. that was very reassuring you know i have a nephew um who who recently qualified as a doctor and there's one thing that he would always say is that you know when we're praying and we're thanking God for everything he's blessed us with we must thank God for us you know we must pray for a sane mind you know we obviously mm-hmm. want good health but say it specifically you know grant me a yes. sane mind because like you say that's mm-hmm. so important if you don't feel good up there nothing else is going to feel mm-hmm. good and that's also that's a very good. important reminder you know Unfortunately, we're going to have to round up the show just now. And there's so much more that, you know, we, there's so much still to, 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 to cover. But I think also very, very important if, you know, um, to remind women that, you know, we think we are alone, but we're actually not. And like you said, there is mm. help out there. And just yes. going forward and getting that help um, makes you actually a very strong and courageous person. Yes. Absolutely. Because you're doing something about it, like you're trying to take control of your life. And also just mm. this reminder, like like I said, you know, because when you're in the state of depression, the serotonin levels are low, you have difficulty, you know, comprehending even the most simple basic instructions like you mm-hmm. say getting out of bed even taking a shower is a mission it's difficult yes. so to all our sisters that are listening right now who are really trying their best to get out of bed who are really giving themselves lots of positive self-talk that i'm going to beat this this is nothing that's just the blues i'm just stressed i'm just tired but you know that there's something more serious out there what would you mm. like to say to them I think the very first thing is don't wait any longer to ask for help, to go seek help for yourself. Don't wait. Don't wait until it is so, so bad. You are not weak. It's a strength. It's a strength to ask for help. It's a strength to want to be well. You're doing it for yourself, but you are also doing it for your family. Your family needs you. Your family wants you to be here with them. They want to share things with you. And when you're well and when you're in a good space, you can do that with them. But when you're not, you can't. So you're doing it for yourself, but they will really, really be the ones who benefit so much from that at the end of the day. And I know moms and and women in general just do, they automatically want to help other people, right? Whether it's their families, their kids or their friends, whoever it is, we have this innate ability to just want to be there and and be there for others. So you will be able to. It's not going to last forever. Getting the help is, is... exactly that you're gonna you're gonna be okay you're gonna figure it out but take that step that initial step which can sometimes feel like the hardest step is the most important step of all Mm -hmm. and once you've taken that step help is available and you will be well on your way to recovery and also very important is that you are not alone there are so many people who have Mm -hmm. been in a depression before you there are so many people who are with you and there are so many people that are still going to be coming in so mm. if you're not going to look after yourself and protect your sanity and mental well-being, nobody else is going to do it. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Nobody but else no, is that, going to do it. You are not alone. There is help out there available. Please, please access it. Use it. I, I think one more, one more thing, and you know, coming from you, it will sound so much stronger, mm. that when, especially us as women, we have all these responsibilities and all these different titles that we hold. And we feel this immense guilt when we say, I can't manage, I'm tired, I'm not coping. And the worst thing I think for us as women is we find it's very difficult to do is when we say we need help. There's nothing mm-hmm. wrong. There's nothing wrong in being mm-hmm. tired. There's nothing wrong in saying no. that I need a break. Mm. Absolutely. As I said, society likes to equate success with all of this, being busy and, and constantly go, go, go. And I think that's got to stop. That we've, we've got to change that at some level. We have to have a break. We have to rest. But I just want to say, you are enough. Mm. And try and just remember that. You are worthy. You are enough. Um, you know, and you deserve, you deserve to feel good. And you deserve to, to receive the help that you need. Absolutely. And if this help is not um, taken, like, Unfortunately, sometimes we feel like, again, like we say, that the intention is to break the stigma. But if we're going to 
you know, push things away and, you know, just sweep it under the carpet. You could be mm-hmm. a teenager going through this. You could be an adult that may have pushed away um, childhood issues. It's going to come and bite you later. Mm-hmm. It does. It doesn't go away on its own, unfortunately. Final message to our listeners. Um, I think, yeah, baby, thank you so much for this opportunity. And just to say, I hope you, you take something from this that's, that just encourages you and helps you on your journey. Um, as I said, to reach out if you need to and to remember, even if you are depressed, even if you are going through something that makes you feel out of control or very stressed out or not like yourself, you are not a bad person. You are enough. And you deserve to get the help that you need. 100%. And to you, Diane Moses, thank you so much for holding my hand through this journey. I wouldn't have been able to do this without you. May the Almighty reward you immensely. And may you be blessed with continued success. And may you be rewarded immensely for your beautiful heart. Love you always. Thank you so much, Bibi, and thank you so much. I mean, I really, as I said, it was an honor walking with you on your journey. It was an honor to see you just coming into yourself again and reclaiming who you are. And that's that's just such a, a fulfilling and incredible feeling. For thank you so much. So thank you. God bless thank you. you. God bless you. To our beloved sisters, a reminder again, a reminder again, you matter You are phenomenal. Allah loves you. You are enough. And if you are feeling a little bit under the weather, please, please, please get help. You are not alone. You deserve to live the life that you want. Go out there and grab it. And remember, if you are not well, if you are going through a depression, please remember you are not alone. There is help out there. Inshallah, you are always in our duas. On behalf of myself and my sound engineer, Hamid, we wish you a beautiful week.